Anybody else? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together here, both in person and virtually by this wonder of technology that not so long ago would have seemed impossible, but now brings us together from all parts of the world to hear and study your word and share fellowship with, each, with one another as we can. We thank you here in Harrisburg as we have mild temperatures and spring rains as we look forward to those uh, May flowers that are brought on by the April showers. We thank you that all this reminds us of that wonderful cycle of life through which we live through the dark and cold days, through the bright and sunny days, and all those kind of days in between. We know that you're there with us, you care for us, and you remind us of that cycle of our life that finally culminates in our eternal life with you. We ask that you be with those we've mentioned with needs and concerns for myself and others who preach the good word through these, this season of Lent and Easter and the upcoming Holy Week. We know it's a wonderful privilege, an opportunity to be able to share that good news and the message, especially of the resurrection. And we pray that you keep us healthy and well so that we're able to do that. For Emma, as she recovers from her cancer, we pray that that Therapy she's getting now is able to keep that cancer at bay and she remains healthy for a long time. For Sean, as he gets better, we look forward to him being able to do the things with his family that he enjoys doing. And for another wonderful year with Jane with us and look forward to many more birthday celebrations with her. For Dennis, as he recovers from his injury, we pray, Lord, that it's not too serious, that he's able to be back at work and doing the things that he should do and the things he enjoys doing. For Tasha, as she deals with her cancer, we pray that they might find a way to treat that. And especially, Lord, the folks of Ukraine, we see on the news the terrible atrocities that are happening there. We wonder how people can be so cold to other people, how people can seem so heartless in their treatment of others. We pray, Lord, that you would open their hearts to understand the hurt the damage they do not only to those who they directly affect but those of us around the world as well we know lord that you desire peace for all your people and we pray that we could find a way to make that happen with your guidance and your love we ask that you be with us today as we study your word as we talk about this coming palm slash passion sunday and that meaning to us in our life of faith as we begin to enter into Holy Week and that week we spend in real time with you, we pray that you would help us to understand all that that means for us and for the world and to share that meaning with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <coughs> and now. You know, the Russians are cool because I remember during the war when the Americans would bomb us. <laughs> Mm. But the Russians, they fly really low and shoot the people on the sidewalk. Oh. So. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems to be something about that culture, you know, that they, some kind of cruelty there. But except some are very nice, you know. Yeah. I remember a Russian soldier gave me a loaf of bread on my birthday. <laughs> well, and I'm sure, you know, it's like everybody else. We can't mm. say because they're yeah. this or that, you know. Um, we can't lump everybody into yeah. one, but um... I remember when we, when our where I lived in East Germany, uh, first the Americans were there, and then because of the Geneva Convention, they had to give it over to the Russian, and whole families went into the lake. Yeah, found themselves. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. I don't. Yeah, I mean. Um, well, before we get into the lesson for today. I wanted to talk a little bit about this Palm slash Passion Sunday. Um, I really don't remember it. I grew up in a church that didn't have, didn't observe Lent. Um, we didn't you know Passion mm -hmm. Sunday. I think we maybe done a, had done a little bit about Palm Sunday. Um, <clears throat> Easter was a big celebration. But as far as Lent, Holy Week, that kind of thing, it really wasn't practiced or observed at all uh, in that church that I grew up in. Um, 
even Ash Wednesday. You know, all we knew of Ash Wednesday was that something Catholics did. Um, so we really, uh, so to, to my experience, a lot of this is, is relatively new. Um, but there was a time when Passion Sunday was two weeks before Easter, <coughs> and then Palm Sunday was one week before Easter. Hmm. And if you go online, you can find all sorts of information about which popes changed it and who did this and that. Um, but the, some of the best information I found is actually from a uh, United Methodist website. <coughs> and um, <coughs> uh, I'm just going to read you some of what it has to say here because it gives a good explanation uh, and actually dispels a little bit of what I thought um, was the reason for uh, the change. <clears throat> so it says, um, many remember that these two events, Passion Sunday and Palm Sunday, uh, were not always part of the same day. Their memories are correct. Prior to Vatican II, it was typical practice to read a Passion narrative on the Sunday prior, which would have been <laughs> this past week, and then celebrate Palm Sunday as a day in itself to kick off Holy Week. But beginning with the publication of the three-year Roman Catholic lectionary in 1969, followed by the ecumenical three-year lectionary and calendar projects that culminated in the common lectionary in 1983 and the revised common lectionary in 1992, um, which is what we now use, the revised common lectionary, uh, mostly. Um, it says that changed. <clears throat> Somehow folks have gotten the notion, and this is where I found out I was wrong in my thinking. Folks have gotten the notion that the primary reason this changed was a concern that people may not be likely to come to services on Good Friday, where they would hear the entire passion narrative. Mm -hmm. Low turnout, it is thought, prompted the lectionary people for convenience sake to put the passion narrative into Palm Sunday. <coughs> well, uh, as well, so that more people would have a chance to hear it. Given the variety of folks who seem to say this, apparently that story has gone viral in a number of circles. I'm one of those, quote, lectionary people, one of the two official United Methodist representatives to the ecumenical consultation on common texts that created and continues to support the revised common lectionary. He's currently the secretary. Um, as one of the lectionary people, I can tell you that's not why those who came before me did what they did. <clears throat> so here again, I was one of those that assumed um, because we were afraid people uh, wouldn't come. Um, you know, we just kind of lumped it all into one day. So feed them the whole dose while they're there. He said, that's not the case. That's not why it was changed. Um, What was really at stake was a recovery of ancient Christmas pra Christian practice, not only of this Sunday, but of Lent itself. A recovery that was part and parcel of many findings of liturgical scholarship and ecumenical work beginning in the late 19th century. And then he goes on to talk about how um, there was a, a what's called a three-year catechumenate, a three-year preparation for people to be baptized into the church so it wasn't um you know it, you weren't just automatically baptized as, especially as an adult there was this three-year catechumenate this three-year learning wow. period that you went through um <clears throat> and um when he talks about that training and, and what the point of it was but then he says this three-year catechumenate was then compressed into 40 days of lent as early as 387 in Syria. So we're looking, you know, 1900 years ago or 1700 years ago. Um, then all, all but disappeared entirely across most of the former Roman Empire by the sixth century. And this is interesting the way he, he states this, replaced by a hodgepodge of practices later known as confirmation with a focus more on doctrine than living the way of Jesus. Uh, the, Lent, the ways of Lent started to be used for another purpose. And this is when he talks about Lent then becoming a time of fasting, a time of 
meditation, a time of prayer, and not necessarily a time of preparation for baptism. Um, so then he says, as a result of all this work by all these Christians worldwide over all this time, we are where we are now. With the recovered Palm slash Passion Sunday as the hinge between a recovered Lent and a more intense Holy Week. So apparently, you know, this is going back to a more ancient practice um, rather than simply because we were afraid people weren't going to come to church. Um, now, I was confirmed on Palm Sunday. Yeah. But then the week before oh, at church, you had it in front of the whole congregation, you were drilled. Yeah. Of your beliefs and everything. You had to stand up and say whatever. Oh, really? Question. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and that's what I thought was interesting when he talked about this um, hodgepodge of practices that we call confirmation. Um, because even, you know, among local churches and local Lutheran churches, we all have different practices. Um, confirmation isn't always on the same day. Uh, you know, it's more uniform in the Catholic Church, I think, but. Um, you know, in other churches and, and Protestant churches that do confirmation, um, it's kind of, you know, as he says, a hodgepodge. So, <clears throat> and in fact, we pretty much missed a whole year of confirmation with COVID and all that stuff. You know, we have some who are uh, of that age that when we do it, who I haven't got started yet because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. So then, um, so just one more note, he says, Lent is a 40-day season of fasting and spiritual preparation intended to help congregations accompany candidates for baptism during a home stretch in practices, ritual and disciplines uh, critical to living in the way of Jesus. Lent proper begins on Ash Wednesday. Lent proper ends on Palm slash Passion Sunday, a day that in turn inaugurates Holy Week. So, um, and, you know, it's interesting, he talks about uh, Palm Passion Sunday being a, a hinge uh, between Lent and Holy Week. Um, it was an article in Living Lutheran, our Lutheran magazine, where the pastor talks about uh, it being a mirror, where we, we hold a mirror up to ourselves as far as Jesus being greeted. <coughs> um, in triumph and, and glory and then by the end of the story it's turned around to where he's being crucified so we're getting an echo from somewhere yeah so uh you echo yeah <laughs> maybe that's here turn my oh can you guys still hear me yeah mm -hmm. no echo that's right. Okay. What's coming out of here? <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, just again, a little explanation behind Passion Palm Sunday. And especially for those who remember, um, you know, pre-1969 or whatever, when it was the separate days. What I found interesting was, if we look at the calendar and the way things happened, that Passion Sunday, Sunday came before Palm Sunday, which meant, yeah, and, and I don't know, um, and one of the things I looked at about the Roman Catholic Church said that, um, like, what was Passion Sunday was called the first Sunday of the Passion, and then what we now call Palm Sunday was called the second Sunday of the Passion, and it was this whole two-week season um, in the Catholic Church at one point. So again, you know, things have changed. Um, but I just thought it was interesting, you know, you would think you would have Palm <laughs> Sunday, the triumphal entry, right. on one Sunday, and then, um, <clears throat> but I guess thinking that the entry, you know, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem came at the beginning of Holy Week, this coming Sunday would be the proper Sunday to celebrate that. Because that right. kicks off, as I often say, this is the, the only week in the church calendar that we live in real time. You know, we have the whole story of Jesus and the church in one year, except for this week. This week, we, have, we come into Jerusalem with Jesus on Sunday. 
we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, things that are happening. Uh, then Thursday is uh, the Last Supper. We celebrate that with Jesus. And the foot washing, too. Right? And the foot washing. Uh, Friday, then, being uh, when the day Jesus went to the cross. Saturday, the vigil, waiting for the resurrection. And then Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection. So from home, Passion Sunday, uh, through Easter Sunday, we live that in real time with Jesus and his disciples. Um, and then from there, again, we speed through. Uh, but we sort of, up to Pentecost, even we have seven weeks of um, Easter, which ends at Pentecost. Pentecost being 50 days, it was a celebration already uh, for the Jews, whenever the Christians uh, had the experience of the coming of the Holy Spirit. So we do, from Easter to Pentecost, we celebrate that um, 50 days, that seven weeks. So in a sense, we go from, you know, Holy Week, um, from Palm Passion Sunday till Pentecost Sunday, kind of in real time. Now, is that uh, just, <clears throat> you don't count the Sundays, right? Well, like in Lent, you don't, you don't count the Sundays with right. 40 days. But I think no, in you Pentecost, do. In, we do. In Pentecost, you do. <laughs> because <laughs> because it's seven weeks, weeks that's 49 days. Seven days. weeks is 49 days. Yeah. So I think you have okay. to count the Sundays. Yeah. So a little uh, quirks in our, our church calendar, I guess. Um, so what we're going to look at as far as the gospel today is uh, the processional gospel. And... <clears throat> If you recall the Palm Sunday service, um, we have we begin with the processional gospel. Um, we go through uh, more or less the first part of a regular worship service, um, and then we have an Old Testament reading, and then we uh, do the Passion, uh, the story of the Passion, uh, from one of the synoptic gospels, as we call them. Uh, well, from, and we do John as well. So we have from one of the Gospels, we do the story of the Passion every year. Um, and the way we've done it uh, the last couple years here, the way we're going to do it this year is uh, to make it, I want to say, a little more bearable. Um, we break that Passion reading up so that we have myself as a narrator, we will have the lector, who this year at 8.15 is Randy Whitaker, 11 o'clock is Sandy Sherwood. Um, they will be the part of Jesus, and the congregation is everybody else. So, you know, um, rather than find the centurion and the witness, and because really those people represent all of us, and we're all a part of that story. So we read that passion story with those parts, narrator, Jesus, everyone else, and then we break it up with verses of hymns throughout the reading. So it's, um, you know, it, I think it's, it keeps us from tuning out. You know, while I don't want to say it's, it's any less meaningful if we do the whole thing at once, um, you have a tendency by the time you get to the end of, you know, two chapters of the scriptures, you have a tendency to maybe tune out a little bit. Um, so it keeps us a little more engaged. And the fact that everyone in the congregation has parts to play in it, I think it, it keeps us more engaged in the story. So um, <clears throat> we've done it that way again a couple of years in the past. Um, I actually went online yesterday, um, or no, Monday, went online on, on YouTube. You can still go on and see what we've done in the past. Um, our worship services are still there. And I looked up last year's uh, Palm Sunday service. And for one thing, we were still using the old video camera. So it's like, you know, you're you know, watching it through bad glasses or something. Um, but I also then recalled that we weren't singing last year on Palm Sunday. So we had Jay Snyder as a sort of speaking cantor, if you will, in the choir law. So Joyce would play the tune, and then Jay would read a verse of the hymn, and then we'd go on. So we've now, of course, come to the point where we can actually sing this year. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, part of that that resurrection of the church I, that that I'm looking forward to, as well as um, celebrating the resurrection itself. So, it's sort of nice how everything comes. You know, first we got the pew cushions back. Uh, now we got the hymnals back. You know, it's it's sort of yeah. Nice. yeah, and that was when we talked about that with the task force and the worship and music ministry. We said let's let's. For one thing, it's safer. You know, you yeah. take a step, a step, a step. And then for another thing, it kind of builds up that anticipation toward that joyous celebration. Um, so it, it worked out. You know, really, when you think about it, it was two years ago, uh, just before Easter, that we shut everything down. Yeah. yeah. You know? It's hard to believe that it's yeah. two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and March, here it is. March 13th. Exactly. Something yeah. like that, yeah. And that's when Judy died. Yeah. 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 Because I remember doing the the Easter morning service by myself out in the yes. um, meditation yeah. garden. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, that's still online somewhere brought, too. It's brought yeah. our church into a new. Yeah. A new thing. Yeah. So it's you know it's kind of interesting that it was right before Easter that we shut everything down and now as Easter comes we're we're opening things up. Um, and that was when we realized the value of social media uh, for the church, yeah. because we're told we reached more people on that Easter Sunday than we ever had before, because wow. because people were home watching, and a lot of it was curiosity. The you Christmas know. too, didn't you? <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I think a lot of it was curiosity. People were on, wanted to go online and see what different churches are doing and see how they were celebrating Easter. And so, you know, that's when we realized that, hey, we have something valuable here. But I just always felt bad for the people that do not have, mm -hmm. you know, because they're just watching those televangelists. That's what Phyllis does, mm -hmm. you know. Now, today she's going to have a taxes done, so she they couldn't come. But I hope to maybe, maybe a good Friday or something. Yeah, that'd be nice. And it's, you know, and again, it's true, we, we do reach a lot of people but there again there you know there's no perfect way i guess to reach everybody and i had an interesting this um, you know today's kind of a let's just share things day <laughs> mm -hmm. um but i had an interesting experience yesterday we were talking about um you know the services being online and you know i was kind of lamenting the fact that a lot of people just for convenience stay home um you know and they do yeah and and but then the person i was talking to gave me a different point of view oh. um a young parent young mother who said you know uh her week is so hectic and her sunday mornings were always so hectic because you know she had kids to get ready for church she had to get herself ready mm -hmm. to church. all this was going on she said when she came to church she really didn't feel like she got a lot out of it yeah. And so now at home, she sends the kids to another room. She, she watches sit. the service herself and she could, she said she feels she gets more out of it at home than she does by mm. being here. Mm. Mm. And, and as we talked, we realized that a lot of that too is personality. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Yeah. Do you enjoy being with people? Do you enjoy being alone? You know, and, and it really kind of, well, it made me feel bad in a way because I always had this idea that well, people are just stayed home because they don't feel like coming, you know. So now, to all those people I might have thought that about, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> because there are very good, legitimate reasons for being home, uh, watching the service online besides an illness or something like that. So you're forgiven, Jim. So it was a good insight for me. <laughs> yeah, it was good insight <laughs> for me. <laughs> so. Um, so just we'll take a quick look at the lesson today. Um, again, this is the processional gospel. Uh, this opens the Palm Sunday service, and it talks about um, the, the, the subtitle here is Entrance into the Final Days. Um, after he had said this, Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. <clears throat> um, so a couple of things uh, by way of introduction. Um, uh, Crossmark says it's quite ironic to read this as the processional gospel on Palm Sunday. There are no branches of palms mentioned in Luke's account as there are in John. There are no leaves from the field as in Mark. There are no branches from the trees as in Matthew. There are no leaves or branches of any type mentioned in Luke. Can't they get the act together? Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and, and note that only John talks about palms. So isn't it interesting that, you know, of the four gospels, only one of them actually mentions palms and yet we call it Palm Sunday. And they were all there at the same time. Well, actually, the the, the gospel writers weren't. Oh, well, they weren't. Okay. You know, the gospel writers wrote 50, 60 years later. Oh, okay. So they're writing according to what they've been told. Uh, they're writing according to what is important to them. And, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Luke's gospel... Um, and of course, it's a little different. I mean, all the Gospels have little differences. Um, but Luke has two stories just before Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Um, one is, well, all three have the healing of a blind man. But in Matthew, it's two blind men in Jericho. Matthew and Mark um, follow the triumphant entrance. Luke follows his healing with the story of Zacchaeus. So we have the healing of a blind man. We have the story of Zacchaeus. They are contrasting pictures of Jesus, Jesus' ministry, how people react to Jesus. Um, with Zacchaeus, Jesus comes and stays at his house. It's a story about what happens when Jesus is present. In the parable of the blind, in the parable, the nobleman goes away to a distant country. It's a parable about what should happen while the ruler is temporarily away. So now it's almost as if Luke is setting up the story of Jesus so that we have Jesus and his triumphal entry. Jesus is present, he's glorified, he's worshiped. Then at the end, Jesus will be gone as he's crucified. And now what's supposed to happen while Jesus is gone? How are we supposed to live? And, and what are the disciples supposed to do? Um, with Zacchaeus, the emphasis is on the salvation that has come to his house. Um, the fact that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. In the parable, the emphasis is on destruction. As for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Um, so again, this idea of judgment, if things aren't done as they should be while Jesus is gone, we have this sense of judgment. Um, and, and so again, looking at the different gospels and the way the writers set them up and provide their point of view, uh, can give us some insight into what they feel uh, is important. Um, and then another uh, introduction uh, from another commentary. Uh, Jesus has been with his disciples for about three years. The date was 30 AD, and it was his last visit to Jerusalem. 
When Jesus and his disciples were about three kilometers from the city, he sent two of them ahead to the group to pick up a male donkey from an acquaintance living nearby. Jesus then set off riding toward Jerusalem. The disciples couldn't contain themselves. They started shouting out at the top of their voices, here comes our king, blessed is he in the name of the Lord. The religious officials were a bit put out by the clamor. It seems presumptuous to say the least, and the Roman authorities could well get wind of all this and think they had an insurrection on their hands. The truth was finally out and nothing could keep it hidden. When Jesus came in sight of Jerusalem, he paused and wept. Here was this beautiful city, so special in the sight of God, and soon it would be destroyed by foreign armies. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not welcome God's coming to you. And so that, again, is the, the context of um, what's happening here on Passion and Palm Sunday. Um, as we uh, get into the story, there are some um, Old Testament references. Um, let me see what we got here. Um, well, a couple things that, that we get only from Luke's Gospel. Uh, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, only Luke tells us, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Uh, in Luke, the entrance of Jesus causes a division among the crowd, which is not found in the other Gospels. And again, you know, this is, um, well, related to this emphasis, the disciples in Luke do not shout Hosanna, the Aramaic phrase meaning save us, I pray. What is anticipated at the coming of the king is peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So again, Luke's gospel emphasizes peace through our fellowship, through our love of Jesus. Um, and yet throughout Jesus' ministry and even beyond, we have so much division. You know, we have division in the church. We have division among believers and non-believers. Um, you know, we have our different denominations. Um, we have, you know, Muslims, Christians, Jews, all these other kinds of divisions that we look forward to one day being resolved and reconciled through Jesus and through our faith. Um, so while Luke presents these divisions throughout his gospel, his real point is our hope, our prayer, our promise that Jesus will heal these divisions and bring us together. So, um, you know, I think that's something that we sometimes miss out on. Um, we look at salvation as an individual thing. And, uh, you know, part of that is, I think, our American society of, you know, being our own person, living our own life, doing it our way. Um, we are pretty much individualistic people here in the United States. Um, but we need to look at scripture in this sense of reconciliation of the world, reconciliation of creation. Um, it's not just about us, not about us individually. Um, <clears throat> Jesus is greater than that. And, um, and perhaps that's one of the things that, you know, Luke's gospel might remind us um, that we, you know, we have this sense of Jesus reconciling the world and not just each of us individually. And, you know, as we talked about, um, as Easter comes up and we have this sense of resurrection from COVID, if you will, you know, and it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, but yet we still have this tragedy going on in Ukraine that proves to us that life uh, is not perfect and won't be until uh, Jesus comes again. So 
uh, just so much depth, I think, uh, to our faith and to our lessons. And while we look at Palm Passion Sunday, and we see this turnaround, it makes us sort of understand how fickle human nature is and how sometimes we miss out on the depth of life and the depth of our faith. Um, you know, there's all these things that go on on the surface of, oh, Jesus is the king, you know, they praise him, they glorify him. And then at the other end, there is this surface idea of, well, Jesus is dead, he's crucified, he's gone. Um, but then there, there's so much more to it when we get to the resurrection and knowing that Jesus will be back again. So our, our, we have a danger of being, as they say, a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, um, we, we want to we grow that depth of our faith. We want to really uh, try and come to grips more with what Jesus means for the world and not just for, for each one of us individually. So um, just, you know, an interesting um interesting outlook i guess for palm passion sunday um and i'm i'm going to kind of wrap up here and then let you guys have some comments if you do but um he ends here by saying when jesus enters jerusalem his disciples pray for peace in heaven and presumably on earth which will bring glory in the highest but his visitation causes a division Tom Mullen, who wrote Laughing Out Loud and Other Religious Experiences, makes this statement about his denomination, the Society of, Fre Society of Friends, or Quakers. Okay. They work for peace. And if you really want to cause conflict, work for peace. So it was for <laughs> Jesus riding into Jerusalem. So, um, yeah, kind of gives us that outlook. You know, Jesus... You know, and even like at Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill to men. You know, it's all yeah. all this. We talk about peace, and yet all the divisions that are caused um, on the way to, to achieving peace. I guess. Yeah. So, what kind of thoughts do you guys have? Well, you know, and. Um about people getting together, you know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. the, in um, this German pastor that I know, they sometimes do lots of things with the Catholics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and at one time, I think we did too. We did with St. Margaret the Choir and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And that has all gone by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh and well, when I was in Les Trobe, we had, and I've, I've commented on this to some of the local pastors, we had a really good ministerium in mm -hmm. which we had the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Catholics, um, even, you know, like at Thanksgiving, the, the, the rabbi would join us and we would do joint services. And, That's neat. And it was really yeah. nice. So we, yeah. Um, on Good Friday, there was a three hour service at the big Lutheran church in town. And it was based on the seven last words. And there would be seven different pastors from seven different churches wow. and it was all denominations would come in and speak on you know and people That's would come neat. and go throughout the afternoon but it went from 12 to 3 and it was a very ecumenical service so, Ruth that was good. I have a question about the orthodox calendar so we can't you hear you they... can you hear me we can't hear you um, I, I can hear her. her. I can hear you, Ruth. Yeah, I can hear yeah, her. I can... There we go. Uh, are you all right? <laughs> okay. So my question is about the Orthodox calendar and why is it a week difference? And the the Christians here, whether they're Orthodox Christians or not, they all celebrate Easter on the twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. This this year it's on the twenty fourth. So it's a week after our Easter. So I'm, I'm just wondering how that came about and why that is. 
because I know in the United States, I had a, have a friend who is Eastern Orthodox and her Christmas and her Easter was always at later at a different time than ours. Right. And my wife grew up in the Byzantine church, uh, the Byzantine Catholic church, which was the same. They, I'm, I'm probably going to get this mixed up. There's a Gregorian calendar and a Julian calendar. They follow one and we follow the other. <laughs> Okay. I'm not sure which we are. We but... we follow Julian calendar. Okay. Julian. That so I they, know. They, they still follow the Gregorian calendar, which makes okay. them a, a week different than us. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, usually like when we're celebrating Epiphany, they're just having Christmas. You know, so yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. what makes it it's the difference in the two calendars. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Good question. Anything else? If there's nothing else, I'll go rest my voice for a few minutes before we start church. So let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our the Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The glory, ever and ever. It's always interesting to do that virtual Lord's Prayer thing, you know. Yeah. You want another one? Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Farewell. Everyone have a wonderful day.